When he reaches the Office of Emergency Management, he's shocked by what he sees. To my amazement, nobody's there. I saw um, coffee that was still hot, they were still smoldering. They had screens all over the place, the screens were blank. So we, I didn't know what was going on. At, at that time I received a phone call from one of my higher ups. And um, he said, where are you? And I said, um, I, you know, the emergency command center. A long pause. And then he came back and he said, get out of there, get out of there now. At 9.59, the 1,300-foot South Tower collapses. Debris and dust are thrown over a huge area, and Tower 7 doesn't escape. These are some of the only pictures of Building 7 at that moment. Just over a minute later, the fire alarm in Tower 7 is triggered. But because it's on test, there's no information about where the fires are. A bunch of smoke and glass, and I think we're just about the last ones in this building right now. I think you should leave. Everybody else is gone. Okay. I wanted to get out of that building in a hurry, so I started. Instead of taking one step at a time, I'm jumping landings. When I reached down to the sixth floor, there was this eerie sound. The whole building went dark, and the staircase that I was standing on just gave way. At 10.28, the North Tower collapses in just 11 seconds. This time, Tower 7 takes a direct hit from the collapsing building. According to the official account, this is the start of a chain of events that will ultimately lead to the collapse of Tower 7. The World Trade Center complex in the heart of downtown Manhattan contains seven buildings occupied by many of the world's leading financial companies. The Twin Towers rose above the site more than 1,300 feet tall. Tower 7 was 610 feet tall and just 350 feet away from the North Tower. As the North Tower collapsed, debris hit Tower 7 and fires were immediately reported in the building. Early evidence of explosives or just debris from a falling skyscraper. Barry Jennings was still trapped inside. When we got to the 8th floor, I started walking to one side of the building. That side of the building was gone. And he heard sounds that unnerved him. The first explosion I heard when I was on the stairwell landing, when we made it down to the sixth floor. Then we made it back to the eighth floor, I heard some more explosions. What sort of sound? Like a boom. Like, a, like an explosion. And more than one? Yes. Barry Jennings was also an eyewitness to the fires that were spreading through the building. I could smell fire, you know, you could smell the smoke, and I felt the heat. It was intense. The official investigators say ordinary fires were responsible for the collapse of Tower 7. But if that's right, why didn't the fire services fight them? There's no way to put the fire out. Well, we got all kinds of water problems. The uh, two trade buildings took out the mains. You know, we can handle just about everything. This is beyond. 
When they collapsed, the twin towers severed water mains, stopping the sprinklers in Tower 7 and severely hindering firefighting. Eventually, fireboats were used to pump what water they could from the Hudson River. A new group has been set up bringing together architects and engineers from across the country that question the official explanation. Richard Gage is a member of the American Institute of Architects. He's been an architect in California for 20 years. He set up the group Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth, which now has more than 390 professionals from around the world. No steel frame high-rise building has ever collapsed due to fire, and we have over a hundred examples uh, from which to choose. In 1991, a fire in a Philadelphia skyscraper raged for 18 hours, but it didn't collapse. In 2005, a 32-story building in Madrid burned for a whole day. There was a partial collapse, but the building remained standing. Tower 7 burned for seven hours. The Madrid building burned for 24 hours. My understanding is that the steel around the perimeter was not fireproofed. In Building 7, we have a completely fireproofed building to two and three hours. What's more, a series of experiments were carried out in these giant hangars in Cardington, Bedfordshire in the mid-1990s. They showed that steel buildings were more robust than previously thought. The Cardington tests in the UK were exemplary in that uh, the steel did not uh, collapse as a result of these tests. A purpose-built eight-story steel building was set on fire. For a short time, the steel reached temperatures of more than 1,000 degrees centigrade, far hotter than in Tower 7. Ceiling beams did sag, but no collapse was observed in any of the six experiments. I'm deeply troubled by the collapse of Building 7, because if the official story is true, then what they're telling us is that our existing building codes, to which thousands of skyscrapers are currently designed with two and three hour fire protection, uh, there, there's a serious problem. The official investigators accept the fires in Tower 7 were never hot enough to melt steel. They think the steel was heated to about 600 degrees centigrade, crucially the temperature at which steel loses half its strength. According to the official investigators, the main fires were concentrated on floors 6 through to 13, except floor 10. And there were fires initially on some of the upper floors. A fire protection engineer who's joined the group says the fires were not severe. The fires weren't burning on all the floors simultaneously. They were scattered about on the floors. And as they burn, they're going to move through the building, so it will certainly heat up some of the steel in an area. But then as it moves on, when it consumes the combustibles there, the chairs, the desks, the tables, uh, whatever papers were there, then there's no longer any source of heat. After surviving for three hours, trapped inside an inferno, Barry Jennings was finally rescued. When we get outside, a police officer comes to me and says, you have to run. We have more information of bombs, so you have to run. When I got to the, maybe the 19th block, Channel 7 Eyewitness News says, can we talk to you? I said, I need an ambulance. The guy said, well, just let me talk to you right quick. We started walking down the stairs. We made it to the 8th floor. Big explosion. Blew us back into the eighth floor. All this time, I didn't know it. All this time, somebody had called my wife, told her I died in the building. Big explosion. Who comes over the TV set? Whose voice comes over? It's mine. And my sister said, "Wait a minute, that's Barry right there." I said, "This is it. We're dead. We're, we're not going to make it out of here." I took uh, a fire extinguisher and I bust the window out. This so my wife comes flying back down the stairs and says, "Wait a minute, is is this live?" Because we were told he was dead. And a little caption in the corner, left-hand corner of the TV said, said that it was live. The two tallest buildings in New York had just collapsed. And just after midday, firefighters were watching Tower 7 nervously. The deputy chief of the New York Fire Department that day remembers the scene. 
Well, we had uh, our special operations people set up surveying instruments to monitor and see if there was any movement of the building. Uh, we were concerned of the possibility of collapse of the building. And we had a discussion with one particular engineer there, and we asked him if we uh, allowed it to burn, uh, could we anticipate a collapse, and if so, how soon?